I have to start with the usual disclaimer. The opinions I'm going to present are strictly my own. I'm sure that some of them DOD would abhor. Uh, so again, these are private. These don't reflect any official position of the Army, Department of Defense. There are seats up here. There's also some seats over here for anybody who's looking for them. Uh, I'm going to try to do something a little bit different today. I, I've seen dropped in on a couple of these, and it seems like a lot of times the talks are about events and issues. Today we really are going to talk about great decisions. And uh, I, I want to turn things a little bit because in reality, the greatest decisions coming on this subject are going to be made by you in the future. America is at a crossroads. Uh, the, where the country goes from here on in is much in question. Uh, the results of the last two administrations would imply that the American answer to these questions are no. That the Pax Americana is no longer worth it, looking at the Obama and the Trump administrations, and I'll talk about some of that. Uh, some of you I know have read the articles in the, the, the Great Decisions book that were sent on this, and, and there was some good material there, but I think it misses the point. Because I think a lot of the reasons why there's a question about Pax Americana is not as much about what's changed in the world, but what has changed in the United States. And, and I think Americans are very much coming to question uh, really the whole essence of what it means to be an American, what the United States is. I want to start out with, here's the agenda, things I want to talk about today. I'll go until probably about uh, two, and then we'll do the usual break. Uh, I want to throw out a couple opening questions to think about, a couple of quotes. I'll explain what a PAX is, which is, for those of you, that it may be repeat some of the material that was in the reading material for the lesson. Talk about some of the things that laid the groundwork for the PAX Americana. Talk about the overreach of the Clinton and Bush 43 administrations talk about retrenchment under Obama and Trump. Uh, and talk about some of the criticisms of the American expansion, criticisms of the American empire, if, if you're going to use that term. And then I want to talk about the, what I think is probably the key issue, which is the waning of the American dream, which is this, we're, we're losing a sense, I think, of what America has been and, and what it will be. And then we're going to talk about current state of the, of the PACs, and then I've got, like I said, I've got this bunch of questions I want to throw up for you to ponder during the break and try to turn the tables and make you people talk a little bit more than me when we come back. Start out with a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville from his famous book, Democracy in America, 1840. I sought for the greatness and the genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there, in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there, in a democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. And the question to think about is, is America still good? If you read the latest national security strategy from Donald Trump, one of the key assumptions is the fact that America is still good. Another question to ponder that I'll, I'll get to a couple times during the presentation. Uh, as, as my introduction said, I was involved in the uh, rewrite of American counterinsurgency doctrine for General Petraeus back in 2005-2006. We had a, a conference in 2006 with the State Department where we we're going to try to do the same thing for the State Department, try to develop a doctrine for the interagency. It was a disaster. We, that's another story we can get to later. The interagency is incapable of doctrine. But we had a very good uh, lead-in uh, speech by Sarah Sewell, who was then the director of the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard. And the question she brought up was, is the United States a revolutionary power or a status quo power? And, and our, the history of the United States is, is, whips, is we whipsaw between those two particular elements. You know, a, 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 a revolutionary power is one that wants a democratic world, universal human rights, uh, and the turmoil that that brings. A status quo power wants a stable power, 
where, where relationships are stable and the world is stable and there's no violence. Uh, and the question is, which one of those worlds do we want and what are we willing to expend to make that happen? It's much more expensive to be a revolutionary power than a status quo power. And we, again, in American history, we whipsaw between the two. Now, again, those of you who read the material for the lesson can kind of probably explain what a PAX is if anyone did not. A PAX is basically, as, I, as it says up there, it's a secure and stable political and economic order backed by principles of the prevailing military power. Normally starts with a great military victory. In the, in the case of most people talking about the Pax Americana, we're talking World War II. And it's maintained through a number of things. Foreign interventions, deterrent threats for their military forces and economic power, cultural and different exchanges, and also international institutions. You also control the world order by tying everyone together with institutions, which have been, that's, and that's been done differently by different uh, major powers. Historical examples, the first one people talk about the Pax Romana. Actually, some historians will actually even take it broader than 26 BC to 180 AD and go for almost 100 years either way. Uh, but the first great time where you have one major military power kind of setting the stage for world order, you've got the Romans, and that's followed by the Mongols. You know, they have a little different style. You know, the Mongol style of, of diplomacy is you pile a bunch of skulls in front of the other guy's city until he gives up. Uh, that is, a, you know, that's a method. Uh, and then you have the, the, followed by the Pax Ottomana from the, you know, the, the Ottoman Empire, which actually begins with the fall of Constantinople in 1453 and ends with, the, with their defeat at the Siege of Vienna in 1683. You know, people sometimes forget how powerful those Muslim armies were during that period, and they really did control the world order. And of course, what most people are familiar with is the Pax Britannica, which begins with the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo and ends with World War I. You know, when, when Britannia ruled the waves and there are British colonial armies all around the world, obviously, you know, there are still conflicts in the world, but the general course of the world order is controlled by the one major military power. Now, we talk about the Pax Americana and the roots of it, very much tied up in interna international institutions. It's a strange empire. It's, not, it's, it's been called an empire by invitation by some critics. Uh, it's based on, you know, we use force to uphold order and stability when we can, uh, when, when it seems necessary, but generally we try to do things more through international institutions. A lot of our, if, if, a lot of our uh, enemies uh, out there in the, that we're fighting in the war on terror and, 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 and a lot of our, you know, even the Russians and the Chinese and others will complain about that the globalization is American plot. And they're right, it really is. I mean, globalization is something that America has nurtured. It's something America desires. We come out of World War II and we try to tie the world together, but really under our control. Uh, the Bretton Woods agreements in 1944 start to set up the world financial system, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Now, those are con the way that those are set up is the controlling, the votes depend on how much money you put in, the, in those funds. And since the United States has put by far the most money in those funds, the, the United States controls who gets loans, who gets grants, who gets help from the IMF and the World Bank. So we, it gives us kind of a lock over the financial system. Obviously, United Nations, when it's set up in 1945, it may be hard to believe, but back when it started, it was very much an American-controlled body. Uh, no longer is it that, in that condition. We are the ones that pushed the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, 1948, which has evolved into the World Trade Organization. This is very much something America wants, this, this idea of open seas, free trade, capital flows based on the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar remains the world's reserve currency, which gives us immense power over the world's financial markets. We've also pushed respect for international law, human rights, you know, the Helsinki Accords, human rights uh, laws and regulations we have pushed. Uh, we have done a lot of security guarantees and military interventions. We're in alliances all around the world. Uh, again, it, it, it's like, as I said, the people would call it an empire of invitation. The people who 
associate with us want to be there. They've joined these organizations voluntarily. Uh, though as I talk about it, I, some, in those, those, some of those relationships are fraying and, and the, you can question the equanimity involved in some of them. Okay, let's talk, you know, obviously a lot of, like looking at this audience, who most of you seem to be my age, uh, we all lived through this. We all went through that. How many people here remember crawling under their desks at recess? Oh yeah, I went through that. The, uh, went through the Cold War. Again, it's, it's, it's an, uh, some people will say the Pax Americana really doesn't start till 1989. Uh, and you can make that argument. There is some balance during the Cold War, obviously, between the United States and Russia. Uh, you know, they, we, we have our own little, you know, they have the, the Warsaw Pact and their bloc, and we have our bloc. Uh, there's still, it's still a bloody period. I mean, you've got Korea, you've got Vietnam, there's still wars going on, there's all kinds of conflicts in Africa, but they are proxy wars. We don't fight the Soviets head on. Cuban Missile Crisis is close, but we don't get that far. Generally, the containment strategy works. You want to read an interesting document sometime, you had to get a copy of NSC 68 and read it, which is really the core of containment. You can actually, it's usually downloaded off the internet somewhere. It's a pretty long document. It's basically a bad staff study where a bunch of ex-military people get together and develop a courses of action. And like a usual military staff study, it's got the one course of action they want and three throwaways that nobody in their right mind would ever do. And you present it to your leaders and say, obviously, you got to do, do A. In this case, it's basically that the, our, our big edge is in the economic realm and that the, the Soviets will not be able to keep up with this. If we can contain communism from spreading, eventually they will self-destruct. And the strategy works. Eventually, the, 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 you know, the, the Soviets, I always saw the Soviet Union as, as, a, as a, basically a third world economy trying to maintain a first world army. And eventually that, that collapses, it fails. They overstretch in Afghanistan. There's all kinds of internal tensions within the, within the bloc, and the balloon wall falls down. And 1989 to 1990, the Soviet Union collapses. And all of a sudden, we have our unipolar moment. And it's, it's we are prima inter paris. The United States is, is supreme, and everyone recognizes that. Some historians call it the end of history. That no longer, that, that, that the Soviet Union is gone, and it's that the, the world has changed. Uh, if you remember the, uh, the, the, the theme of the Gulf War, this, the, you know, George H.W. Bush, this is the new world order. You know, this, is the, this is the way the world is going to come. Everyone comes together to expel Iraq from Kuwait. There's a euphoric moment where it seems, you know, we, we've even got, you know, the, 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 there's no veto from the, from the Russians. We have Syrian and Egyptian and Saudi Arabian forces going into Iraq with us. It seems like there's a, there's a, a, new, a new era of, of, of common uh, cooperation. Then what happens in 1994 is this thing. This is the 1994 National Security Strategy of the United States by William J. Clinton. And it is it called a National Security Strategy of Engagement and Enlargement. The, uh, what this does, this, this basically replaces containment as the American grand strategy with, with basic what is, what is democratic peace theory. If anybody is familiar with democratic peace theory, it's a political science school which basically says that to make the world peaceable, if you make everybody democracy, democracies don't fight, uh, they, they cooperate much more with each other and therefore we need to, that's what we should push, we should push democracy. And basically the, this national security strategy makes the policy of the United States to forcibly spread democracy around the world. 1994, and, and you can find threads of that in every national security strategy since. This idea of, of pushing democracy, fostering democracy, doing everything we can to create democracy around the world. Uh, and, and it leads to an increasing willingness to use military intervention to increase stability and spread democracy. There's an interesting exchange in Colin Powell's memoirs uh, 
an American journey, my American journey, where he talks about having a meeting with, with the President Clinton and his cabinet about intervening into the Balkans, going into Bosnia in the early 1990s. And there's this exchange. My constant unwelcome, unwelcome message at all the meetings on Bosnia was simply that we should not commit military forces till we had a clear political, political objective. P Powell's argument was we weren't gonna fix the problems in the Balkans with military force. Those were political problems that had to be solved different ways. The debate exploded at one session when Madeleine Albright, our ambassador to the UN, asked me in frustration, what's the point of having this superb military that you're always talking about if we can't use it? I like his next thing. I thought I would have an aneurysm. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, the American GIs were not toy soldiers to be moved around on some sort of global game board. But Powell's point was just that the problems in the Balkans were not problems that were going to be solved with military force. Agree or disagree. But it, it, it's, he loses. He loses the argument. He eventually leaves the, leaves the uh, 1990, he's moved out in the 93, I think he leaves. And uh, within a couple of years, we're in the Balkans in full force. Uh, what happens during the Clinton administration is about a 500% is a increase in, in the use of military force. This is a chart. It starts under George H.W. Bush, but when it reaches, gets in the Clinton administration, it's a, it basically steady states, and like I said, it's a 500% increase in the use of American military force since the end of the Cold War. And these SSC means smaller scale contingency. That's a use of military force. It's all kinds of things. Everything from deploying naval ships to fight pirates to sending 170,000 troops or 300,000 troops to Desert Storm. I mean, it, it's a bunch of different contingencies. But what happens, you'll see during the Clinton administration, we've got 25 or so of those going on every month all over the world. You know, by the time we get to the 9-11, to the, uh, to, to we've got American military force in over 90 countries on all kinds of expeditions doing all kinds of things. Now we get to George Bush and 9-11. Remember, one of George Bush's big campaign pledges was, I'm gonna get away from nation building. No more nation building. We're not gonna do that anymore. We're just gonna pull those forces back, cut down an American military bombing around the world. Obvious, obviously, after 9-11, that all changes. So you gotta kinda of understand his view of the world. And, and why it leads us where it is. He's, first he sees that, that a terrorist threat that cannot be deterred. If someone is willing to die for, for something, how do you deter them? How do you deter somebody who's already willing to die for what they believe in? So he says, we have, we have an enemy that cannot be deterred, and they desperately want to get WMD. They desperately want to get chemical, biological, nuclear weapons to use against us to, for mass casualties. And again, remember, before we go into Iraq in 2003, all the intelligence agencies said Iraq had WMD. So you had, to, had to, you had to eliminate access to those weapons. So there is, you know, even though we don't find the weapons to the degree that we were supposed to, and that gets discredited, there are other reasons also to go into Iraq in 2003 for George Bush. And it ties into this whole view of the world. If you're just going to kill terrorists, they're basically playing whack-a-mole. If you're going to achieve a long-term solution, you can't just kill alligators. You've also got to drain the swamp. There's a group, out, there's a group of neoconservatives, of which you know, Donald Rumsfeld is one, uh, Wolfowitz, you know, a number of people in the Bush cabinet are neoconservatives, who actually believe very much like the Clinton administration did on, on the importance of spreading democracy and that it should be done by force and that's how the world is going to be reformed and transformed. And so for them, democracy has to be planted by force in the Middle East. If you plant democracy in the Middle East, you'll drain the swamp. If the, dem if the Middle East becomes democratic, all the terrorists will go away and that's the long-term solution to our terrorism problem. So one of the main reasons to go into Iraq in 2003 is to create an island of democracy that will spread through the Middle East. And actually, if you look back at the, the, the immediate aftermath of the invasion of Iraq, there is a wave of democracy that starts to sweep through the Middle East that lasts about six months. And once Iraq starts to deteriorate and fall apart, 
all that momentum in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and other countries basically disappears. But that is another one of the major motivations to go into the Middle East, is to plant democracy there. Now let's talk about the whole global war on terror. Uh, obviously, it's a pretty amorphous, unfocused target. I mean, I don't know how you do war on terror. It's like war on poverty, war on drugs. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, those are big topics it's hard to focus on. Uh, but we were, we were actually victims of our own success to a large extent. Afghanistan, nobody expects the Taliban to fall in a month in Afghanistan. There's a lot of criticism for not having any plan to rebuild Iraq. There actually was a plan, it just wasn't a very good one. There was absolutely zero about Afghanistan. Nobody expects to have this country on our hands in, by, the, by November of, of 2001. Nobody expects the Taliban to fall that fast. There is no, nobody has thought about what to do with Afghanistan after that happened. The military forces are on what they called a strategic movement to contact, which basically means they had no clue what they were doing. They were basically doing, they were told to attack the Taliban, they do, and all of a sudden the Taliban collapses and they're stuck with the country. So what happens is there are conferences first in Bonn in December 2001, and then in Tokyo in, in, the, in January, which basically lay out, we're gonna create democracy in Afghanistan and all these, these uh, major nations pled billions of dollars in aid for Afghanistan to make it work. The bottom line is the goals are never met. The people don't live up to their, to their promises. Probably what they expected to do could not have been accomplished anyway. I try to tell people, you know, that, that you know, people, we had this philosophy going into Iraq and Afghanistan that if you just had elections, that meant democracy. And we all know that's not the way it works. Uh, we also waste, I mean, one of the tragedies of Afghanistan is there's a four-year period after the fall of the Taliban where there's nothing going on there. The Taliban's gone. It's a time to, would have been a real time to, a time to consolidate, rebuild, figure out where to go. But of course, we get distracted and instead go on to Iraq. And Afghanistan gets neglected. Four years later, the Taliban comes back in full force, and we're where we are today. Again, there are plans to reconstruct Iraq. I was in part of a war college team that developed a very good one, just nobody paid attention to it. Uh, that's another story. But again, based on a lot of bad assumptions and high expectations, we create this Iraqi democracy that would take care of itself. Uh, the new coin doctrine that some of you heard me talk with General Petraeus about back in March, uh, March of last year, uh, created some success, but, but we didn't have the commitment, to, the long-term commitment to make it work. And what happens is you end up with this, as a result of the frustration of Afghanistan and Iraq, you have this frustration with military intervention that basically helps produce the election of Barack Obama and eventually leads to a 2012 defense planning guidance that says we're not gonna do this anymore. No more counterinsurgency, no more stability ops, goes back to the Bush campaign promise of 2000. We're not going to do these, these excursions anymore. I actually got, got this chart out of a Washington, this, this cartoon out of Washington Post in February 2003. I just thought it was a great cartoon. It explained exactly what was happening in Afghanistan. Again, this is February 2003. This is just before we go into Iraq. And of course, it shows a bunch of little soldiers doing an Afghanistan barn building. And a little man comes over from the side and said, okay, let's go go help rebuild Iraq, and of course all the soldiers are running away, and what's gonna happen in Afghanistan? It's all gonna collapse. And that's exactly what happened. I just thought at the time that was a very prescient cartoon, and I've used it in numerous forums. But talk about the Obama legacy. Lots of different numbers out there from his administration. Generally, though, the national debt went up about 120%. Now again, in relative terms, it went up 90% under Bush 43. But of course, that was about five, trillion and Obama goes up about 10 trillion. But this whole idea leading from behind confused everybody. And that was the, the, the leading, that, that was his, President Obama's dictum. We're going to lead from behind. He admitted in an interview that his worst failure was Libya. Uh, I actually helped contribute to that. Uh, I was invited to a session in, in Washington. Uh, Michelle Flournoy, who was the number three person in the State Department, invited a bunch of people down to Washington to talk about as we're going into Libya, how we could keep Libya from becoming another Iraq. 
Uh, I mean, that, you got to understand the way we get into Libya is because we actually end up following the French. The French are the first ones to start to bomb the bomb to defeat to take out Muammar Gaddafi, and we're going to follow the French. When I taught military history at West Point, like Henry Gole in this audience, and maybe some others. Uh, Robert Doty was our department chair. He was, a, he, was a, he was probably the preeminent French 20th century military historian. And he used to talk a lot about the French in classes. And we all got a, we got a, a copy of, a, of an exam by one of his students that we all thought was great. Probably should have got a maximum score. I don't think Colonel Doty gave him that. He basically said, talked about American military history. He said, we went into World War I to bail out the French as they were about to collapse. We went into World War II to bail out the French after they've collapsed. We go into Vietnam to bail out the French after, after they have collapsed and left. What we should do for future military interventions is find out where the French are planning to go and get there first to prevent the mess from happening. <laughs> but, it, but again, in, in Libya, we end up following in the, following in the French. And the, our, our little group got together and we asked, our first question was, what forces do we have on the ground to use to help us get our policies applied. None. We're not allowed to have any ground forces at all. We're going to have to try to do this through proxies and influencing other people. So we said, oh, OK. Uh, so we started out and we said, the first three things we came up with, we've got to prevent the, 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 the rebels or anybody there from getting a hold of weapons. We've got to con get control of any of the government weapons caches. Then we have to make sure we don't start a weapons buyback program, because that just becomes a a false economy where people bring in weapons from all over to sell. It's not, no any, not any good, except for shoulder-fired air defense weapons, because those are very important, and you do want to buy those. You want to make sure you're paying more than the market price so they're coming to you and not going to somebody else. So there's this little guy that's from the State Department sitting in the corner of the room. And as all the smart guys are talking about that stuff, he's getting in his chair. He's getting lower and lower and lower. Finally, he raises his hand. He says, yes, so I've got some inputs for you guys. First one is, we've already lost control of the weapons. They're all over the place. Can't do it. Second is, we've already started a weapons buyback program. Good news is, we have started a buyback program for the shoulder-fired air defense weapons. And we said, how much are you offering? Half the market price. So basically, it was a very frustrating meeting. We accomplished nothing, and, and Libya is a mess. Uh, but it, 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 the whole, the whole international relations-wise, the whole the whole eight years was a mess. That obviously, there's a lot of blame to go around with what happens in Iraq, but neither al-Maliki nor President Obama really committed to the SOFA agreement would have taken to keep American troops there. His surge decision in Afghanistan is a terrible decision. He only provide, he provides less than half of the troops they needed and announces a deadline. So if you want to screw up the advantage of a surge, announce a deadline so the enemy knows, oh, good, we just have to wait a certain amount of time, they're going to leave. They're not committed to staying. Uh, I want to turn to a couple of critics of, the, of, of, of empire. Uh, what they see is this American attempt to expand, this American attempt to push beyond its boundaries too far. I want to talk about two, and interesting, they're both military men. Uh, first, William Appleman Williams, who was a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Williams had to go through life with a terrible handicap. He was a graduate of the Naval Academy. But he, he saw the American pursuit of free trade, which has always been one of our big, part of the, the a key of the liberal international order, free trade, as nothing more as a form of American imperialism. That the reason we always push for open door and free trade is so we could have a colonial empire without the colonies. We were selling American goods on American ships. It was all for pros American prosperity. We really didn't care about the world. It was all very much in our own, for our own prosperity. So he was, a very, very, he was a critic of this push for open trade and trying to force the world open. He, again, he thought that was a, the form of American imperialism. Another critic, Andrew Bacevich, uh, who is a, actually a West Point grad. Uh, know, I know Andrew well. Uh, he has been, become the great critic of what he calls the new American militarism, which he sees as this American drive and military intervention as, as, as basically a force to expand American power and empire. Uh, his desire to go, is to go back to the traditional American view of the city on a hill. Remember, the Puritan idea was the Americans would go out, we'd, we'd come to the United States, come to America, 
We'd set up this colony and everybody would just look to us and see us as a positive example and we would not get involved in the rest of the world. And, 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 and Colonel Retired Basevich, really, that's what he would like to see, what he'd like to see us refer to. You know, there's really a tragic irony with, with Skip. His name, Skip is what we call him. Is he writes this book about the dangers of expansion. His son follows in his father's footsteps, joins the army, and is killed in Iraq in 2007. So I, you know, I don't always agree with what's, what uh, Skip Basevich says, but he has a pure right to say whatever he wants to. But, uh, but increasing Americans are doubting both the advantages of free trade and the advantages of military intervention. Let's talk about trade deficits. These are current trade deficits. 340, this is, this is at 2016. Again, 347 billion from China, 69 billion Japan, 146 billion from the, the European Union. Uh, and you can see the other countries there. Actually, we actually have some countries with a positive balance. You know, the Brits, the Dutch, Belgium, Saudi Arabia, most of the Arab countries, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, we actually have a positive balance with those countries. Those countries actually buy far from us and we buy from them. Not by much, but, it, but they do. But you can see, I'm, the one that surprised me was Italy and, and Ireland. You know, that, that we've got so much, I'm not quite sure, what are we buying from Ireland? Italy, I guess, are buying you know, handbags and shoes, but I'm not sure, what do we get? I guess a lot of Irish beer, I guess. Guinness? $36 billion worth of Guinness. Again, what do the, the deficits really mean? You know, this, this is open to some debate. You know, we're still, a lot of the money comes back to the United States. A lot of the, you know, the Chinese are buying a lot of American companies and American uh, real estate. Good thing or bad thing, you take your argument either way, but a lot of the money does come back to us. Uh, the numbers are kind of, kind of iffy because global, the multinational corporations, global supply chains kind of confuse what these numbers really are. You know, if, if Hyundai's building a car in the United States, who really is getting the money and where's it really going? We have lost two million jobs to China, at least, though, as a result of the, the, the trade deficit has had an impact in that respect. Uh, we still do dominate financial markets. The dollar is still the world's reserve currency. And there is great fear that if the, if a return to protectionism will lead to the depression like it did in the 1920s. So there's a great fear about getting away from free trade and, and starting to have these battles of, of tariff wars again. Let's talk about the state of the US Armed Forces on the military, military intervention side. Still the best in the world by far. 13% of our American military today is non-deployable. You may have read some of General Mattis's comments. The idea now is they're gonna put out a policy that if you're non-deployable, you can't stay in. That means they can't go overseas, can't be used. 71% of Americans 17 to 24 can't surf. The recruiting base has shrunk considerably. The force in dire need of modernization after over a decade of counterinsurgency wars. It's a very fragile force. One of the things that came out of the future of the, 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 future of the Army study that was done for Congress was that the Army has no plans to mobilize or regenerate. There's no, and it's not just the army, it's the rest of the, the force. They're, they're just, it, it's not, it's a fragile force. The draft's gone, the industrial base is gone, the training base are, is gone. You're not gonna be able to create it very quickly. Uh, if you have a war, a, a war with a near peer, you're really not ready for any kind of major losses. Uh, how many people have seen the movie Dunkirk? One of, the, one of the numbers I like to throw out for Dunkirk is in the nine days of battle over the beachhead at Dunkirk, the British lose 187 Spitfires and Hurricanes in the air superiority battle over the beach. You know how many F-22s we have in the whole force? 182. That's another, another thing to bring out. Another thing about military interventions is if we go someplace and want to accomplish our national objectives, we are always there for a long time. You know, George Bush said we'd be in, in Iraq for six months, never happens. Bill Clinton said we were going to be in Bosnia for six months, never happens. We're always there for a long time. I was invited to another smart people meeting down in Washington. With, uh, with, this is with the, 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 DAS, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Stability Operations. 
and uh, Jim Shearer. And he, he sits us all down, a bunch of smart guys, and he says, what's the future of stability ops? This is before, this is early in the Obama administration, before he comes out with the DOD planning guidance. And Dave Kilcullen's there. Dave Kilcullen, who's the, the leading anti, you know, counterinsurgency expert, and counterterrorism guy, he gets up and says, we're not going to need stability operations anymore because the world has become so much more peaceful the last couple decades. And I stood up and said, Dave, the reason it's so peaceful is because there's American troops all over the place. That's why it's peaceful, because we've been doing this stuff. Uh, but that's the legacy. Of military interventions are never short. If you're going to do it, you're always going to be there for a while. Now I get to the, to the, the core, the, big, the one other argument I want to throw out here. I recommend, a, when I, whenever I have a, I teach a lot of international students in the War College here, as, as all of us do. And we always have them give briefings on their culture. Explain your culture to us. So I was, a few years ago, this, I had a couple students say, well, we, want to, we want to know about American culture. What book can we read about American culture? So the book I recommended to them was one called People of Plenty, Economic Abundance in American Character, by a guy named David Potter, who was a professor at Stanford uh, back in the 1950s. And, and basically what he talks about is how Americans have been shaped by assumptions of abundance and mobility. You know, this really brought, the difference really brought home to me. I was doing research on a trip in Vietnam, and I was in the airport in Hanoi, and we're getting ready to board, and board a flight to Da Nang, and we're all in the little assembly area, and they announced on the you know, flight, to, flight to Da Nang, now, now getting ready for boarding, and they open the doors, and everybody gets up and dashes out the door and jams on these buses, and then the buses get out to the aircraft, and everybody dashes off the buses and fights their way in the airplanes. And I'm standing with this old Vietnamese gentleman. I said, wow, you know, in the United States, we kind of wait for our turn and kind of stand in line and much more ordered than this. And he says, yes, because the United States, you know that if you stand in line and wait for something, and when your turn comes, there will be something there. We do not know that in Vietnam. And it, 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 so it, it does shape the way we operate. You know, there's plenty for everybody. You know, and, and there's a couple core beliefs here. Not only is there plenty for everyone, but the next generation will be better. Our children will do better than we will. And that's been a core of America, and it makes Americans optimistic. It makes us generous. We prize freedom of education. We have high expectations for democracy. We expect government to kind of stay out of the way and just let us, let us move on. I had a, a, I can't remember if it was an Australian or New Zealand student in one of my classes say, you know, America is not a country, America is an idea. There's a lot of truth to that. And my concern is that idea is changing. 2014 survey, 59% of Americans said the American dream was unattainable. 63% said the next generation would not be better off than the parents are. 2015 survey, taken of millennials, 50% of millennials said the American dream is dead. You know, millennials, obviously, the younger, younger generation. Now, recent polls are a little better. Actually, with the, whatever you think of Donald Trump, his election has indicated there's been an uptick in enthusiasm about the economy and about the ability of the American dream to be obtained. But it's still only maybe, you know, it's, it might get to 50%. I mean, that's a very different America than the one that David Potter writes about, People of Plenty. It's a very different attitude. So now Americans see limitations where there used to be opportunities. They're now questioning the costs of our role in the world. Now, we're, and we're being challenged. Now, with the, those of you who did the readings, you talked about all the rising powers. China is not only rising economically, it's also trying to set up competing international institutions. The Chinese are setting up their own banking system. They want to take away control. They've invested a lot of money in the IMF and the, and the, and the World Bank, but they're also trying to create a, a competing bank in, in, the, in Asia to exert their influence that way. Uh, you know, we know about the, the rise of Russia. When I was teaching at West Point, I remember this is during the Balkan intervention in the 90s. I remember coming into... Uh, all, all, my, all the people who were teaching for me, all the young captains had just come back from the Balkans, most of them. And I remember coming into my office, and there was this little box out in the hallway, and a little sign on it that said, Collections to Rebuild the Soviet Empire. <laughs> because they, they, they felt the world was a lot more organized and a lot more simple when it was just us and the, us and the Soviets. 
Well, the problem is now we've, got, we've still got all the mess of the 90s and they're on, and now the Russians are back too. And obviously they are challenging us on a number of fronts. Uh, the best way I had it portrayed what, happened, what they did in Ukraine and in the Crimea was that the Russians played a bad hand very well and the West played a good hand very poorly. We've got, of course, the rise of the BRIC, you know, the, the, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, the rise of these competing economic powers, Iran and the Middle East. One of the great dilemmas of the nuclear North Korea is what's, gonna, what's that's going to do to Japan? There are already rumblings in Japan about rearming before North Korea events such a threat. It's a more serious rumblings now. If you want to get people in Asia scared, you don't do it with, a re with, with China, you do it with a rearmed Japan. There's all kinds of ramifications if that happens. And some predict it's not going to be America's demise that brings the end of the Pax Americana. It's going to be the rise of these other powers. Now let me talk about our allies and the state of our alliances. This is the, the state of the Bundeswehr. This is the largest economy in Europe, the German economy. They recently announced in their, in their Reichstag, and they were in their, it's not the Reichstag, it's the Bundestag, I guess it is, in, in, their, in their assembly that they cannot currently be used in the collective defense of NATO because they're completely, un they're too small and too unready. This is the largest economy in Europe. Uh, in Afghanistan, they had what everybody there called the Sitzkrieg PRT. If anybody knows that any military history, in, the, in World War II between, uh, after the invasion of Poland in 1939, the Germans don't, don't do another major offensive until May of 1940 when they invade Holland and France. That period in between from late 39 to that period in 1940 is called Sitzkrieg because everybody's kind of sit, sitting there. Well, that was the name for the German provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, the Sitzkrieg provincial reconstruction team because it took them 18 months to get a helicopter so they can get any place. I had a captain come back from there and he said, you know, I got so frustrated working with those wimpy Bundeswehr guys, why couldn't we get some of those SS guys I read about? <laughs> I had to do a little history lesson with that young man. <laughs> said there's a little, there's some baggage comes with those guys you really don't want. Uh, but what's happening in the Bundeswehr is they, they can't use, their helicopters are all deadlines, so they gotta use private helicopters to train. Half of their tanks are deadlined. All their submarines are out of, out of commission. Uh, their defense spending is 1.26% of their G GDP. After there was that 2006 agreement for everybody would spend 2% in NATO. They're spending 1.26%. Again, this is the largest economy in Europe. And they can't get anybody to join the military, so they are, they are trying to enlist 17-year-olds to try to fill the when fill their military ranks. That's the strongest economy in Europe and what they're doing for their collective defense. The rest of NATO. There's 28 member nations, the only ones meaning 2% of GDP, US, Britain, Estonia, Greece, and Poland. And you know what kind of state economy Greece has. And even with Greece's problems, they're, they're paying their 2%. But none of those other, no one else is. You know, in 2003, the British could deploy a division and sustain a brigade in Iraq. I recently talking to my Brit friends, they said they can now deploy a brigade and sustain a battalion. You know, there's no, Brit no operational British aircraft carrier. They're actually sharing an aircraft carrier with the French. I can't imagine what that's like. They probably eat well. <laughs> the French army is down to six brigades. That's the whole French army. They have no logistics force because if they go to war, we're going to do that for them. When the French go to Africa for their operations, we fly them there. You know, I, I, I you know, in response to the Russian threat, you know, Poland is buying every Leopard tank the Germans will sell them, and all my friends in the Baltics are preparing their evacuation plans of where they're going to go when the Russians come over the border because they don't, they have, they don't think NATO is going to be able to save them. Other alliance partners are much better. You know, Japan still limited by their constitution. The, the Korean army is pretty big, but they're basically being based now on 16-month draftees. I'm going to talk about Korea as an example of how these different forces are playing out in the world. Korea right now, there's a lot of, you know, with the Olympics going on everything else, you know about the turmoil between us, you know, between, you know, the Trump, you know, the rocket man, Trump exchanges on the, on the Twitter and everything. But it's, 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 South Korea is really kind of a mess right now. There's a generational split. The elders remember the 
in fact, if you, if you, if you my, my wife is Korean, she watches Korean news all the time. And almost every day there are, there are protests in Seoul by the elders who are trying to get Kim Park Dung-hee out of jail. The, the, the president was deposed, but still hasn't been convicted of anything. Uh, but they, they march around with American flags and Korean flags. And they remember America's support to them, and they think the American alliance is very important. The young people of Korea see America as a barrier to unification. They're the ones who elected Moon Jae-in president. They do not value the American presence whatsoever. President Moon had dec has decreed there will not be a war. He can even keep us from going to war. We have been trying to work with, a, in, a, in one of my projects, we've been trying to work with the South Korean government on possible plans for post-war reconstruction, but they won't talk to us because they said there's not going to be a war. Uh, President Moon is much, seems much more concerned about pleasing China and North Korea than us. He's actually, when on the, the, the Trump visit over there, did some very pretty disrespectful things that uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote some very good articles about. He, he's, he's been kowtowing to China more than us. Most Koreans, I think, many, at least, at least many, perceive that we need them more than they need us. They don't really need us. North Korea is not a threat. Their economy is booming, and they, but, they, but we, need our, we need their bases. So they have the power in any negotiations. And of course, you know, you've seen the discussions the presidents have with the Koreans about renegotiating the free trade agreement we have with them. Uh, it's really not surprising, though, that, that they've got a $28 billion trade deficit. I mean, Korea is the size of New Jersey. If you have a place the size of New Jersey with a very large industrial base and you have a big market like the United States, obviously, we're going to buy more of their stuff than they're going to buy of our stuff. Um, but, at, but that's one of the things that's, that's going on as well. So the, all these, and, and there's a lot of resentment in the, by, for the Korea, from the Koreans for that, for this attempt to renegotiate the trade agreement. And there's a lot of frustration in, in, in the alliance on the military side because of Moon, President Moon's attitude about future conflict, which makes planning very difficult. Now, we still have a lot of advantages in the United States. It's still the world's largest economy, largest trader, we still have the world, you know, we still have the dollar reserve currency. That's an immense leverage on the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, all these, all these lists here, you know, the US Navy maintains the global commons. Of all the services, I worry about the Navy the most because the Navy has a constant mission around the world every minute of every day, maintaining global commons. Immense soft power. Every place you go, you hear American music. Everybody criticizes American movies, but everybody watches them. You know, we have a multi-dimensional power base. There's also widespread realization that the American involvement in the world is good. They want Americans to be involved, even if it's only to get money from us. But they really take our involvement for granted. And, and American pleas for a, a more balanced cost sharing are falling on deaf ears. Costs if the PACS ends, obviously. Increased regional stability and conflicts. Weakening of international organizations, you know, the, the rise of competitors, the Chinese attempts to develop its own center of institutional power will be more successful. Uh, we lose overseas bases if alliances break down. Uh, again, somebody like Skip Basevich will say, that's good. We want to pull back. We don't need all these connections. We can maintain our connections to international organizations without the military power and just rely on everyone's goodwill and fair exchange. Uh, if, the, if the international system is in more insecure, then the cost of trade and investment go way up. And there is the fear that if, again, the Chinese have been trying to get the renminbi to become the, the reserve currency and not the dollar, there's a fear if, if the dollar is no longer the reserve currency, then all those people that are holding billions and billions of American dollars will all of a sudden dump those on the market, which will drive our currency values crazy and have major impact on our economy. So the current situation is this. Americans are increasingly unwilling to bear the costs of the PACs. We perceive more problems and limitations at home. We perceive fewer advantages to, to international agreements. Uh, allies have taken this for granted. They've cut back their defenses, and now they're being very unsettled by requests from the Trump administration to carry more of the burden. 
China and Russia are mounting new challenges. Regional, other regional powers are rising as well. And we still haven't come to this resolution about whether we are a status quo or revolutionary power. We still have a vision of spreading democracy and supporting human rights, but nobody wants to commit the resources to do that. So it makes us kind of, you know, we, 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 nobody wants to put the money where their mouth is. Okay, I'm right about, almost, I'm about where I'm supposed to be. I want to throw these questions up for you to ponder as we take our break. And we'll come back and uh, give you a chance to comment on some of these and uh, and take any questions you might have about this tirade that I've just delivered. Uh, the non-deployables, uh, hospital, hospitalized people, pregnant women, so forth. who else is among that? Because it was like 14% or something? 13%. It's uh, mostly medical. Everything from not having your dental stuff up to... Uh, all kinds of medical, but mostly it's mostly medical. Mostly medical and uh, yeah, some of the pregnancy, some of the, the, the family family issues and that sort of stuff, but most are medical. Yes? I'll try number one. I would say that based on Sarah Suo posing the question, the best answer is we are both. And we vacillate between being a revolutionary power and a status quo power. I recently participated in a panel discussion at a Toastmasters meeting, and one of our panelists was born and raised in China, and he made three points about China. He said that in China, it's very, very difficult to get a gun, that in China, they don't have bipartisan politics because they have only one party. And he presented the point that guns cause violence more than they cure violence. So I think returning to the question, the Second Amendment originally provided the ability for states to have militia and for militia, for militia members to have their muskets and to be able to defend the country with their arms, with their weapons. But in recent years, we're still holding on to that revolutionary concept, but maybe we need to be more revolutionary in the way we look at the Constitution and the amendments in order to preserve international stability. You gotta remember also, the other part of that Second Amendment is not just the militia, it's also about to be able to resist an oppressive government. So that's, that's you can't forget that part of the Second Amendment either. Now again, I, why, why anybody needs to have a 30 round magazine or an AK-47, I don't know. But, but that, that's the other part of the amendment you can't forget, is that it is, it, it is part of this, this fear of a standing, fear of, a, of an oppressive government that still is out there. So just, but the, the, other, the militia is the other part of it, though, as well. And the militia is obviously no longer there. Yes? What impresses me, it's not an answer to a question, is, as I see this, the statement, you know, that we need to know our history, because if we don't, we repeat it. But the scary thing is, from what you're taught, the number of people in high places, in different places, the War Department, the President, the State Department, who keep repeating these things. We don't learn. So we really can't make a decision between what we want to do. We don't know what we want to do. Yeah, that's true. I used to tell my cadets at West Point that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it in summer school. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you're right. It, it's, it's, we, we, it, it's, the pro and, and it was a big, I'll be, be honest, it was a big problem in the Obama administration. Because I was always, I've always been a guy who studied kind of stability operations and counterinsurgency. And I was, again, making these arguments about the long-term commitments of military intervention and all that other stuff. And it was interesting when I made the, made the to talk to the people in the Obama administration about that, the answer was, we're not worried about that because those are all bad decisions we would not have made. So, so what they do is dis, you discount the historical record because you say those are all bad decisions. We would not have made that. Therefore, we're not going to pay attention to it. So you can be ahistorical. I mean, there, there's a Colin Gray, who's one of the famous strategic thinkers out there, 
says that's one of the big problems of Americans. We, are, we just don't pay attention to history. We're ahistorical. We don't, we, don't look, we don't look back. We don't understand it. Um, and then part of that, though, goes back to the, 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 to, the, to the David Potter thing. We really haven't had to. We haven't really had to look back much because there's so much. There's so much plenty. It really doesn't matter what went before because the future is so bright. And that's, everybody's always looking forward. Just kind of the nature of America. Maybe that's part of the other things we have to change is we've got to, as we become more aware of limitations, we have to look backwards better. What is good? What is good? You know, is it, and that, that's, that's why I threw that out. I mean, that's, you talk to our allies, the allies are very critical that, you know, if you, if you want us to carry more of a burden, you're not being good anymore. I'm not sure if I, inter I agree with that interpretation, but that's part of it, that's, but that's out there. There's a sense somehow that, that you know, Donald Trump is not a nice man, where America is no longer good. But then you look at what the Bundeswehr is going through and you say, how, how can you expect us to, you're not carrying your side, your side of the load, not carrying your share. But again, it, gets, it depends what side of the coin you're on, how you view that sort of thing. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I'd like to put a question in way of answering two or three of them. Uh, Pox from America worth uh, maintaining. Um, the one about greater burden, own defense, and free trade. Uh, how about if we pick out South Korea, since they seem to think they'd like to go a different direction right now, pull our troops out of there, and let's see what happens. If the North Koreans come across the border, so be it. Uh, let's start giving people an example of what truly happens if we do not help with world peace. Actually, my wife and I have talked about this, and we both agree with you. We both think that, and I'll throw that out. Again, this is my opinion. It has nothing to do with the U.S. government. But you know, my wife, who, who is, you know, she's she's not an American citizen, but obviously she's you know born in Korea, and she watches us. She's just very frustrated with the way the Koreans are they're taking us for granted, and and some of the things that are going on right now. And then she's she's the one who volunteered to me and said, "You guys, why why are you staying? Why is America still here? Why haven't you pulled out and let us go on our own?" Now there are obviously other interests involved here. We do need bases over there. It has been a close relationship. There's still a lot of Korea that very much wants to stay close to us, but. You know, that's, you know, they, they, you know, we can say, okay, you don't think the North Koreans are a threat? We don't need to be here anymore. Uh, of course, the, my concern with that is more that it, it, the impact on other, other players. You know, Japan is the one that worries me. You know, what, again, if you want to scare people in Asia, rearm Japan. But no, that, that's, my wife, and, you and my wife are on the same sheet of music. She would agree with you. <laughs> she would agree with you on that too. Yeah, one here. Okay. So uh, I think that the United States has been the beneficiary of the luxury of abundance for a very long time. And that has allowed this idea of American exceptionalism, individualism, we can go it alone, to really become our national, uh, our national idea. But in a world of finite resources, that idea may be coming to an end. So it may not matter what we think. Uh, the laws of nature may dictate the end of Pax Americana. And there's an abundant body of research that shows cooperators do better than lone organisms. And that goes all the way back to bacteria. Back, uh, so we are in peril if we defy that wisdom. And uh, so I think that uh, there is certainly now a huge uh, anti-communal uh, meme in, uh, extant in the land. And I think that may be, in fact, the undoing of Pax Americana, ultimately. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, 
General Durnford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is very clear in his speeches that the center of gravity of the United States is our alliances. And he'll make the argument. The problem is, though, when you look at, and I look at this as well, and, and it's, the alliances are atrophying. There's not a whole lot, we're not getting a lot from them. Um, I mean, it's, it's, and that's my concern. I mean, looking at the French and the British and how everything is, 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 is shrinking, uh, we don't, again, alliances are important. I don't see them fading away. Even, even the president has backed off from some of his rhetoric. But we're not getting as much from the alliance as we used to. And, and again, you talk to the people in the Baltics about NATO and they say, you know, when Russia comes across, we're all, we're all going to New York and Chicago. Because the NATO's not going to help us. So it, it's, I'm concerned. And, it, and even like I said, the Koreans, you know, President Moon came in and the first thing he did was fire all his four-star generals, put his own people in and change the draftees into 16 months. And boy, I mean, it, it's, I, I'm just concerned that the, the, the Western military power is, is really atrophying away. And we are it, we are, we are it. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I don't know where we go with that, but you're right, we, we value the alliances, especially the military does. We wanna keep as many as we can, but it, it's very frustrating as you watch their capabilities go away. Thanks, Khan. I trust you more than Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching the young people right now. This last shooting up of the schools has made them say, enough. And we got to be right there behind them, supporting them. And maybe we will continue to be a, the American dream. Okay. No, it has. It, it definitely has motivated them and generated that, and that you know, gotten people interested. You know, it's gotten. It's. it's and that's always a good thing. Just a few comments on a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> is there perhaps a a mistaken assumption in that first question about? I, I don't really think we can spread democracy. I think democracy is something that has to be organically grown. And perhaps we can encourage it and facilitate it, but I think that was the fundamental mistake we made in Iraq, thinking we could do that. And, and I think we've got to, we've got to avoid that. Wondering about Pax Americana, I'm just wondering, and maybe you can comment on, is a, is a Pax, Pax China in the offing? And, and do we need to think about that in regard to our own involvement? And then finally, this question about a city on a hill. I really think that requires a, a unified worldview, culture, and mindset within a nation. And I think we've moved away from that. So I don't really think we can serve as a city on a hill unless we start seeing more unification within our nation as opposed to the fragmentation that we, we now have. Okay, the, the, first, the first one was, again, the, I got the other two out of that. I missed it. The first, the first question was on the first one. The spreading uh, democracy? Oh, so, okay, got it. Okay, good. Yeah, that's uh, actually after... Um, after I did the, the I'll, I'll go in those in sequence, because those are all little soapbox issues, a lot of them for me. Uh, first one, let's start with democracy. When uh, I did the initial Reconstructing Iraq study with a guy named Andy Terrell, which we put out in February 2003 about the, we were, the, the, we were about to cause a great mess in Iraq, and the peace is going to be, the, take more soldiers to maintain the peace and win the war and all this other stuff. Nobody paid attention to it. Afterwards, they did. It was too late. But Andy and I wrote another one after that in 2005, and these are all downloadable from the SSI website here at the War College, and we talked about this idea of spreading democracy. And we talked about a good example of South Korea. And we go into South Korea, and uh, in, in, in we, we liber you know, 1953, we signed the armistice and we're there, and democracy emerges in South Korea about 1989. So it's about, about 35 years later, democracy finally shows up. The example I like to tell people is, okay, here's, a, here's, a, here's an historical example for your history majors. The United, the, the United States conquers a country, marches through its capital, conquers all its territory, occupies its territory, and announces it wants to institute a program of two-party democracy and basic human rights. Where is it and how long does it take? It's the American South and it takes 100 years. You're right. You don't. Democracy doesn't fit every place. The, the, the argument I make to people is that 
democracy does not come from elections. Elections come from democracy. And people, that, it makes people think what I mean. The point is, you don't just, it, it takes a, a lot of social and, and, and economic development to be ready for democracy. So yeah, democracy doesn't fit in other places. But my view, the mistake we make in Afghanistan and Iraq is we set the bar way too high. So yes, you're right, and, and we, we have, and many have been disillusioned about that, but it goes in waves, back and forth. Currently, in, uh, when we did the counterinsurgency doctrine, we avoided that. Pushing, we actually had a part in the counterinsurgency doctrine about the advantage of Marxist economies in some societies. And uh, in contrast, the Army's stability operations doctrine was democratic peace theory. It talked about promoting democracies and what you had to do as a military doctrine. So even within the military doctrine, there are conflicts. Okay, the second on the Pax China. Remember, part of the Pax, what makes a Pax is, is military power and the, and the ruling to use military power. I was talking to some of the people up here. I had a discussion with a Chinese general when I was over there, and he was, we were drinking Muay Thai, which is an awful, awful thing. And, and uh, he said, you know, the problem I've got, he said, is I have an army of only sons. Because of their, their, their one-child policy, they're all only sons. He says, I cannot risk an army of only sons. The impacts on society would be phenomenal. So they're, they're, they don't have a military you're going to use many places. So... The problem with the Pax China is economically they're going to try to, to, to exert all the power they can, but they're not going to exert the military power that we have. They're not going to be an interventionist military power like we have. On the, uh, let's see, I can't read my handwriting on the third one. The city on the hill. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, you're right. Can we really, part of it goes back to that initial de Tocqueville quote. You know, at the time of the Tocqueville, it was, this was basically the, the Puritan ethic. It was a very Christian nation, and that was what it was. We now have much more disparate values we exhibit. You're right. I'm not quite sure what kind of a beacon we would be. But maybe, you know, maybe there's, again, it goes back to the American, if the American dream is opportunity and is equal opportunity and prosperity, maybe that could be something that would be a beacon worth seeing. But you're right. It would be a lot more difficult. Okay. Okay. Uh, kind of a comment, if you will, on the first one. Okay. Aren't we really looking for international stability? And part of our problem is we're now trying to put democracy in maybe too many places rather than let it come us and then we can support it. And that really we want to do both, but right now it's fallen to us or has for the international stability. What happens if we're not there would be my first question. If it's not us, who then, because what you've described to us is there's no other military power, and you've just said pox, whatever it is, is going to be based on a military uh, superiority. So the question is, if not us, who? And then what happens if there is no one? We do withdraw or step back. And OK, that's question one. Two, if, if hey, he gave me the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. OK. Uh, OK. My second question is, and probably I, I, the lady up front brought it out, but I think we all recognize this. This country is so divided. And it starts with our legislatures and our, our Congress. And if you watch them, doggone it, that's where the, the leadership should be coming from. And it is not. I mean, they're not facing the problems they've created. And I won't go into details, but I will just say this, regardless of which side you're on, I think most of us would be happy to just see some of these solved rather than the constant bickering. So my question is, what can we do as a country to start doing a better job of bringing us together? And here's the question. Will, will a draft, when we had a draft, people came together from all levels of society and work together. Now, it's going to be tricky, but you had an appreciation for the person next to you. It didn't matter where they came from. When you were together in the drills, or you were in the in the service, or you were on a ship, or you were wherever, you you were brothers and sisters, and you were doing what you had to do. So, would that help this country if we thought about that and help help bring that back together? Okay, let me address those in peace. I actually got it written down this time. If, if not us, who? The bottom line is that the world will degenerate into regional powers. 
the Iranians will control, will be the big major power in the Middle East, the Chinese in Asia, Russia in Europe. I mean, that's, if, we, if we back up, there will be no PACs. There's going to be regional, regional powers will replace us. Uh, one of the things in American history is we've, we've, a lot of, we've, 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 we have rarely trusted Congress. We've always had bad leadership in many, many cases. <laughs> Well, that's 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 overly broad. No, we haven't. But the bottom, but the bottom. If you look at look at look at our look at the late nineteenth century, the government was even worse than it is now. But but because of the sense of prosperity, we didn't care. The gov we didn't, most Americans wanted government to be powerless because there were so many other things they wanted to do. They wanted, didn't want government to get in the way. What has happened nowadays is with this perception of limitations, government now becomes a crutch for many. It becomes necessary for many. And so now we're looking to government to be much more effective than we did in the past. So that, that increases the, the problems there. I don't know how we, you know, maybe we need an alien invasion. I mean, that might, I mean, my, my favorite part of World War II is the first six months of World War II and everything is going so bad and the country really pulls together. That sense of crisis really melds a country that was very fractured before that. So I, we, maybe we need some kind of a sense of outside threat. I'm not sure, but, but. Yeah, we need we need better leadership than we we're getting. But if you look at the, you know, the polls about what we think of Congress, I, I got to admit that the, again, I'm a guy who works with, with when we were doing the counterinsurgency doctrine. The main theme was legitimacy. To be successful in counterinsurgency, you've got to be able to establish a legitimate governing authority. When I was watching the last election, where President Obama said that President Trump was completely unqualified, and President Trump said he was going to throw Hillary Clinton in jail, I felt like I was in South Sudan. I mean, it, it's, and, 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 I, and the other thing is the number of people who did not accept the result of the election. It would have happened on, e on both, it, it would have happened on either side. But we had so many people who would not accept the result of the election. I feel like I'm in a third world country. I think we have a legitimacy problem here as well, which really bothers me. And that, that concerns me. And that goes back to the divisions aspect. And I'm not sure how we get that back. On the draft, having talked to people on this, the issue on the draft is, what do we do with women? You talk, you talk to the draft boards, and that's the thing that they're not quite, because if you're going to do it a draft, everybody's got to get drafted now. That includes women. Is the American public ready for a draft that will put your daughters? It's interesting. We had a session in here at the War College a few years ago where I had a bunch of Army officers up there, and I threw that question out. And they said, of course, we're going to draft women. And these are all males, of course. <laughs> and, I, and my question back to them was, what does your wife think about that? And they all kind of looked and said, ooh, that's going to be one of those kitchen table conversations we have. <laughs> um, so that, that's, and, and I don't see the draft coming back. I think the political costs of it are pretty serious. But, but the issue that you talk to draft board people is they're not quite sure what to do with the women issue. Because that's, you have to grasp women too. Really enjoying your talk. Thank you. Here's a question about the second Dichotomy, second part of that first question, dichotomy. International stability was one of the foundations of the Afghanistan war. 13 years later, billions later, we're still there. Do you have an idea of, of a plan that would bring stability? That's assuming we can even agree on what stability means in a country that's been tried to be contained or made stable by many empires. Just your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah. I actually am involved in a student, a student project here with about eight students looking at Afghanistan and trying to come up with a better way to handle it. We've had interesting, we have a, an Indian officer, a Pakistani officer, a Colombian officer. I mean, it's an interesting group looking at Afghanistan. The, the Colombian is the expert in the drug problem and the Afghan is, the Afghan is doing his work on it, but we can't put his name on the study because his future could be in doubt if his name comes out in the study. But, the, uh, it, it, but we're looking at some of that, those issues. And it's, I mean, Afghanistan, if you look at the history of Afghanistan, the most successful forms of government they had was where they had a very weak central government that was getting a lot of money from foreign countries that they can then feed out to the warlords who then control their own areas. It's never been a very centralized structure and of course we immediately tried to impose a centralized structure with I mean we really didn't we, our expectation of what we could accomplish in democracy we sent the bar too high we shouldn't have established we should have figured out something else than this democratic ideal I think but 
it was hard to sell when that was the big, that was one of our big, uh, you know, points to go in there. And, we're trying, and again, we have this belief democracy is great for everybody, and, and it just isn't. I mean, I think so every so often you got to accept the warlord or accept personal view. You know, all dictators are not bad. Sometimes that's where you have to go. Some societies aren't ready for democracy. You know, in, in Afghanistan, you know, having to work with General Petraeus and some of this stuff as well, the answer in Afghanistan has got to include the Taliban. I mean, they've got to be a player somehow. And there's other issues involved in that. It's got to be something that it's probably going to be regional. And, but I mean, it's something, it, it is one of those things, though, that my argument is, is that we could have kept Iraq fairly stable with just a few thousand troops and the people in the embassy working with the government. But pulling to totally out in 2011, let Iraq slip back. I think we can maintain a, a, a acceptable level of chaos in Afghanistan with a small percentage of troops and, and diplomatic involvement. So I, it's not a problem we're going to fix, but I think we can keep from getting any worse. And I, in my view, that's probably about the best we can do. So that's, that's not much of a solution, but it is a possible way to meet the problem. I'll see what my students come up with, though. They may come up with a better idea. Anyone else have a question or comment? It's got to be somebody else. Oh. I think we're, we're trying to do a lot with borrowed money. Do you ever hear anything from foreign countries and stuff about how long they're going to accept uh, American money? Or is there going to come a time when, uh, wow, this doesn't look like it's too valuable? Is, are they worrying about that? It's a good question. I mean, it's interesting. You talk to the Chinese, the Chinese think they've got us. You're too dependent on us. We've got all your money. They don't. I mean, Americans have most of the money. Most of the money we owe in debt is to Americans. But the Chinese think that because of the trade deficit and everything that they've really got us, that if they, they cut off trade, we would collapse because Americans wouldn't be able to buy their toys and their clothes and all the other stuff. Uh, the, but, but at the same time, they, 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 this is still the... the most attractive place in the world for investments. I mean, people still see that you know, the, the American stock market, the way that goes, they, they look at the way the American stock market is booming. They see the American economy is heating up. You know, the concern in the world now is the American economy is too and too good. I mean, the latest issue of The Economist had this picture of Donald Trump in a hot rod and says you know, the American economy heats up. And the concern they have now is the American economy is doing so well that it's going to drive up inflation and which is going to cause ripples throughout the ripples throughout the, the, the world. So it's the perception is that this is still a great place to put your money that you get. Uh, the, uh, the people will argue about dumping dollars, but the dollars are pretty valuable right now. And again, the dollar still is the, the international reserve currency. So it's good to have dollars around because any kind of financial exchanges you got to do have normally got to be done in dollars. So, I mean, it's still, it, it's a big advantage for us having the dollar as a reserve currency. And again, like I said, the Chinese have been trying to get the renminbi in, and I guarantee you don't want renminbi. One thing I learned when I was in Vietnam, I used to wander around Vietnam with these, and these beggars would come up, and they're asking for money. And I finally found out how to get rid of them, and I gave them renminbi. And as soon as I gave them renminbi, they'd all leave. They didn't want renminbi. We seem to be shifting from answering questions to asking them. That's fine. That's fine. So I'd like to take the last question, is the American dream dying, and ask whether it's changing. For example, a lot of articles point out that millennials don't want to buy the house with a picket fence because they can't expect to be working for IBM for 50 years. They have to be able to take an apartment and be willing to go to Chicago or Silicon Valley and just pack up and leave where the job is. So is it fair to say that the American dream is not dying, it's just changing? It's a good question. Uh, there's, there's truth to that. Though what's happening is you've got this delay where because of the, the, the nature of the, the, this, this lack of stability, um, young people are marrying later, they are having children later, they're sending children to college later, and they're hitting retirement ages with a lot less of a nest egg built up, which causes them to work later. I mean, there's there's ripple effects from the delays happening from this. Um, but you're right. That, that may be the way that maybe it is changing. Maybe we've got to wait and see how it evolves here. Uh, the, uh, 
you know, obviously the goals of the young people are different than ours were. Uh, you know, I mean, we go through it. Lenny Wong at the War College has done some great work about the Gen, Gen Xers and Gen Yers and Millennials. Now the goals change. Now the, you know, the, that they watch the the baby boomers who who are who are dedicated to work and are spending 15 hours a day at work, and they say, I don't want to live that. I'm going to live, I'm going to spend some time with my family, and then there's a reaction against that, and it pushes people certain directions, and you know, the ripple, and again, it goes in waves back and forth. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's evolving. Maybe the American dream is going to evolve. But the question is, can we, can we retain this sense of optimism that went along with the old American dream, the sense of, of a future good, that somehow the future is going to be better. You know, the disturbing statistics for me are the ones where parents don't expect their children to be better off. That was always a key part uh, of the American dream as well. So yeah, that puts us help drive our birth rate down and everything else. You hear a lot about NATO and whether they're going to defend themselves. And the Russians, you know, they made attack or take over. What do the Russians get out of uh, taking over Europe? Say they invade, take over, now they've got this thing on their hands. What do they get out of doing that? Or winning? What do they get out of winning? Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see the, the Russians doing Again, I'm, this is me. This is, I don't, I'm no great expert, but I don't, I don't see the Russians doing that. What the Russians would do is take back, again, the, the, you have a... You have, around the world, you have this rise of nationalism. That's another thing that's impacting on the Pax Americana. You've got a mass, whether it's in Poland, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in China, you've got this rise of nationalism. Whether it's the United States, you've got a rise of nationalism. And you have a perception in Russia that they need to retain the, the areas that were historically theirs. So they're not going to conquer Europe. But remember, the Baltics used to belong to them. That's why the Baltics are nervous, because they see the... And again, the Russians are really smart. When they, the Soviets were smart, what they did is when they took an area, they put a lot of Russians there. So now they're sitting back in Russia saying, well, there's all kinds of Russians in there. I mean, I spent, uh, I, I, got, I got asked to come to Moldova, which is one of the new republics formed when the Soviet Union breaks down, to, to talk to them about uh, counterinsurgency. Because they have a, a, a trans Easter area in, in Moldova that is actually being run by Russian peacekeepers. They have counterinsurgency problem. They had Moldova is a, is a proto state in a real bad neighborhood. It's right between Romania and Ukraine. It's infiltrated by the Russians. It's not really a state, and the, the Russians were really really careful when they when they when they built these these republics up. They made sure they weren't uniquely anything. It's a little bit of Romania. It's a little bit of Moldova. It's a little bit of Russia. So it's so they made sure there's no real unity in the areas. So all these Russian republics are these very, they're, they're almost designed to fall apart. So you've got all kinds of problems in all these different Russian republics, these new republics that are out there, whether it's Ukraine or Moldova or you know, the stands, all the stands. They've all got built-in flaws that the Russians can exploit. And the concern with the Russians is they're gonna, is you've got this move, with this rise of nationalism, there's this idea that we need to bring the USSR back. They're like my captains in the, in the teaching history of the 90s. They want to rebuild the Russian Empire. So it's not, I don't see them marching into France or Germany, but I can see them trying to, you know, Putin took back the Crimea. There's other parts of Ukraine they're cutting away. There's parts of Georgia they've cut away. There's a, that's what I see the danger of Russia is this kind of bringing back pieces that, and again, remember with the expansion of NATO, a lot of these countries are now part of NATO. Or are there parts of the partnership for peace? So that's you know that's one of the concerns here is, you know now the now the Baltics are part of NATO. Well now that, now now this is not just Russia taking away a piece of their old empire. This is now an invasion of NATO, which calls in all kinds of other things. So it's it's got really messy. Um, and I just got a, actually just got a study from NATO today. You know the Russians have this view that NATO promised they would not expand eastward. When Russia, when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1990, and this study goes through very much to show that they did not do that promise. But that doesn't matter. The Russians have already said that there was, you know, whether it's fake news or not, the Russians now believe that NATO violated this promise by expanding eastward, and they are then justified to react against that. So I mean, it, it, it's, there's all kinds of things playing out. But again, I don't see the Russians marching through Paris. That's what the Germans do. Uh, but I do see the. Uh, 
I, I can still see them trying to extend into what they see as more traditional boundaries. It, 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 it just it, it feeds their nationalism. You know, it, 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 it makes them feel great again. We've heard that before. Uh, curious your comments on income inequality in this country. Over the years, of course, it's gotten more and more separated here, and I don't know if that's as you know, look at third world countries, you see a tr tremendous in income inequality and people talk about the middle class going away and maybe the American dream's not there anymore because you have the haves and the have nots and what does it do to our society? It's a lot of things thrown out here, but just your comments and- Yeah, it's good. That. Part of the problem there is it's perceptions. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a lot of the have nots are compared to the rest of the world are pretty good, but, uh, but it is, there is a perception that the, the haves are getting further ahead. Uh, again, that also affects the American dream. I mean, the, the part of the American dream was we could all be millionaires if we want to be. I mean, part of it is the sense that if I work hard, I get ahead, I can be uh, Bill Gates. Um, and there, you know, there is a sense that that's no, that somehow that's no longer that might not be possible anymore. That I can be okay, but I can't get that far anymore. And then there's a certain resentment if you can't. So. Yeah, I'm sure that's part of what's playing into it. And again, it's, boy, the, 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 the economic statistics are hard to deal with. I gotta admit, I'm jaundiced about economics. When I was going to West Point in the 70s, the guy who taught me economics was a young officer back from Vietnam who had been on the team to rebuild the Vietnamese economy. And each class we had was, the first part of class was the economic theory for the day, and the second part of class was why it didn't work. And it's all in people's heads. All this economic stuff is in the people's heads. I mean, the reason Obama's uh, stimulus doesn't work is because there was so much negative publicity that it wasn't going to work, so it didn't. People didn't think it was going to work, so it didn't work. I mean, it's all what you can, what makes the economy, if people, you know, one of, one of the reasons the American economy is doing good now is because people think it's doing good now. If they thought it wasn't doing good, I mean, it's, I just, I'm, I'm very kind of, and so a lot of this stuff about inequality is what do people, a lot of it is what people perceive. How, what is the gap really like? And again, you can read all kinds of different statistics on how that, people, that generally everybody has profited, but the higher levels have profited more. And then, then, you'll, then somebody will say, look at the percentage wise. Well, everybody has profited by the same percentage, but obviously if you have more to start with, you will get more, to, you will profit more. So, I mean, it, it's almost the way you want to argue the statistics. But again, what you talked about is an important part of the perception that may be weakening the American dream. And it's something that definitely has to be dealt with, this perception of, of increasing inequality. Yes? I have the motivation that most people think that the way to solve the problem is to try to educate the population to do right. And 20 years ago, I started having that feeling when I realized that our economy had changed, our culture had changed to the point where we had to have uh, two parents in a family working and not around to school the kids. Uh, now, I might get thrown at rocks by guys and maybe some of the gals. To, I think very strongly that having someone in the household to watch the kids and train the kids is very, very important. And I think we're losing some of that. And where the population is starting to be trained is with social media. And that has some good sides and bad sides, but for the young folks, I don't think it's, it's a good side because they need to have uh, expertise that goes along with that, that has strong basis of knowing, knowing what is right. And it really disturbs me at night when I watch television and see Channel 27 come on and say, it's 10.30 at night. Do you know what your child is watching on social media? No, it's a challenge. Raising kids is, is a challenge these days. I watch my grandkids and my four-year-old daughter is a lot better in computers than I'll ever be. But you wonder about it. But my, my, the, my, the way my... My son and his, his wife are dealing with it. She doesn't watch television. She's very restricted in what she uses. They're really trying to control what she sees. But we'll see what happens when they get to school and you've got six-year-olds running around with their cell phones. I mean, it's definitely a challenge. It is a challenge. Do, do you think, the, I think the American, the public school system is to a certain degree collapsing under 
the current administration, uh, the technology that's interfering and, and, and the private schooling, and on top of that, school shootings. And I wonder about that and inequality and the American dream, because schools are also supported by the community they live in. So if you're poor, you have a less well-to-do school. And I think we lose the sense of equality and the dream of we all have a chance. That's true. I wonder, mm -hmm. That was one of, one of David Potter's points about the importance of education. He would agree with you that if we lose that, we lose a lot of the sense of what makes America what it is. One of the things, the ironic things out there is there are lots of jobs out there that are open. But they're skilled jobs and there are no people to fill them. I mean, my son is, is, uh, is a, an auditor for a major pharmaceutical firm and he's been trying to find competent auditors to fill for, for, for a couple of years now. He can't, there are just no people out there with the skills you need. It's the same thing in all the, all the STEM, all the science you know, technical, all, all those, the, the engineering, the, 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 there, there's plenty of jobs, they just don't have the people skilled enough to do them. And it's, you're right, education is a key for this. And, and, and right, and that, that, again, that's, that's part of the David Potter thing, too. That's one of the things that makes America great. We, we're the pioneers of public education. It starts with the, it starts in New England with the, with the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Everybody has to be educated so they can read the Bible. And it goes from there where you, you know, it, it, it spreads through. The, that's always been the American tradition. that Everybody's educated. Everybody has an equal shot. And you're right. If that falls apart, that's another part that starts to denigrate the American dream. Good point. 